talking about uh, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I do this about every year, a year and a few months, because it's an important, it's an important part of our life with God. September uh, 1976, uh, it's actually September 12th. That's 42 years ago. This past Wednesday, uh, as an, a 17-year-old boy, I received Jesus. I came back into fellowship with God after just being lost as a goose for years, just got away from God on drugs and all, came back to Jesus, and then God graciously baptized me with the Holy Spirit, 720 at night on a Sunday, September 12, 1976, and I celebrate that every year, and I believe it's so important that I like to share the concepts of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with our church family, because I think it's that important. So if you're watching online or you're here and this is something new for you, let me say I was raised in a Southern Baptist home, knew nothing about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, never even heard about it. But my mother received that experience in a Baptist ladies prayer meeting in 1975. And subsequently I received, I didn't know anything about it, but I found out thoroughly scriptural concept. And we've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. And Jesus, of course, in Acts chapter 1, told the disciples not to leave Jerusalem, Acts 1, 4, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. We've mentioned the last two weeks. Uh, the, the gift of salvation is God's gift to the world. But the gift that Jesus has for every believer is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And it's the power of God to minister life to others. This experience became available to the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, which was a Jewish feast day. I mentioned this last week, and, and, uh, and it was really uh, uh, the Feast of Pentecost so we call it the day of Pentecost, and it was celebrating the harvest. So it's uncanny that God chose the harvest feast of Israel called Pentecost to be the day that he gave the power of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the church. How many know we need the power of God to minister to the people around us? Yes or no? So he told the disciples, don't re, uh, leave Jerusalem. In verse 8 of Acts 1, he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me. So two weeks ago I shared, there's three real big things that happen with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Boldness comes on your life, number one, in a way that you've never known before. Secondly, a greater understanding of spiritual things in the Bible comes with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We talked about this in more detail. And then thirdly, a new way to pray. And uh, so I talked about that limitedly today. I want to start, and I won't hardly get started with this today, but I want to talk about 10 reasons that I believe and encourage every Christian to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and then, then to pray in the heavenly language that God gives with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. If this is new information for you, I encourage you to hear what I'm saying, search the scriptures and see whether these things be so because uh, it will make a tremendous difference and have a huge impact in your life. Every day, listen to this, since September 12th, 1976, I have spent a period of time praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, speaking in the unknown tongue, all the same terms mean the same thing. And I actually did the math yesterday, 15,333 days of my life I have spent, some of you hadn't lived that long yet, I get it, but and I have spent praying in the Spirit, and I do it every single day. And there's valid reasons for that. What you'll find in the book of Acts, every person in the book of Acts, and we mentioned this last week in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 8 in the city of Samaria, in Acts 10 in a, in a non-Jewish person named Cornelius' house where they were baptized with the Holy Spirit 10 years after the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, and also in Acts 19 in Ephesus 20 years after the day of Pentecost, every single person in the book of Acts that was baptized with the Holy Spirit had that phenomenon of speaking in an unknown language to them when they received that experience. There is no indication in the book of Acts that anybody received the baptism with the Holy Spirit without speaking in the heavenly language that God gives with the experience. And I've had people over the years say, well, is it necessary to speak in that unknown language or in other tongues with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I would say absolutely yes, it is necessary because everything we know from Scripture of anybody that was baptized with the Holy Spirit, they spoke 
in this heavenly language, including the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. He was persecuting the church. Jesus appeared to him. He fell on the ground, uh, and uh, God raised him up. He got born again, baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, he said, I pray in the Spirit more than all of you Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14. So every single person in the New Testament who received this experience, this after salvation call, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, spoke in an unknown language. So we can and should expect to have a similar experience today. So I've talked about that. Let's talk about it a little bit more. I want to give you 10 reasons that I believe every believer should pray in the Spirit every single day. Number one, I'll get to three today. Uh, I believe we can do it. <laughs> I'll get to three today and we'll finish the rest of them next week. Number one, it's God's will for every believer to pray in the Spirit. Now, I believe that. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians fourteen five says this, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he that speaks with tongues unless he interprets that the church may receive edifying. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. So think about it this way. The apostle Paul prayed in tongues prob- most probably every day because he did it more than all the Corinthians combined. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in the upper room. She was baptized with the Holy Spirit. She prayed in the Spirit. The apostle Peter was in the upper room. And uh, these are some that are revered in the church age. He got baptized with the Holy Spirit and spoke in uh, other languages all of his life until he went to be with Jesus. All of the apostles, uh, with the exception of Ju- Judas who committed suicide, they all prayed in the Spirit. They all spoke with other tongues. So we can and should uh, expect to receive the same experience that they did. Now, there's some people that say, well, I don't believe every p- person that's baptized with the Holy Spirit will pray in the Spirit because the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in fact, uh, they actually misquote this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all evangelists, are all teachers? Do all have the gifts of healings? And then he says, do all speak with tongues? He's not talking about that devotional gift that comes there with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about a different gift that... that, includes praying in the spirit but it also includes interpreting in public and the apostle paul said if you do that in public have the interpretation not everybody's going to do that but every believer baptized with the holy spirit can and should expect to speak in that unknown language and then of course you know many of the denominations the denomination i was raised in many in the baptist church are secessionists they believe all this stopped when the last apostle died in the first century, I mentioned this last week, that's simply, there is no scriptural reference for that. Peter said the promise is unto you, your children, and to all that are afar off any, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. There's no reference in scripture that this should have ever ceased. It should go throughout the church age and every believer today can and should expect to speak with other tongues. So um, there are th- those are most of the reasons that people say that they don't believe in this, but none of them are scripturally, scripturally valid. Again, it's the will of God that every believer prays in the Spirit. Number two uh, out of ten reasons that you should pray in the Spirit every day, it helps unseat, listen to this, it helps unseat the control of the unrenewed natural mind that it exerts over your spiritual life. I want you to think about it like this. When, when God first created Adam and his wife Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, you know, we have a little bit in Scripture about it, not a whole lot, but we have enough to know that they had regular, obvious, regular fellowship with God because God would come down in the garden in the cool of the day to fellowship with them, and he would talk to them and commune with them. He set them as under rulers over the earth to dress it, keep it, take care of it, and he said, I give you dominion over everything over the earth, under me, of course. But, and so God dialogued with Adam and Eve. And let me say it this way, before the first man and woman sinned, their spirit was in communion with God. How many understand that? Their spirit was in communion with God. And their spiritual nature and the, the spiritual part of life took precedence over everything else. Spiritual life was first, relationship with God was first, hearing from God was first, seeking first the kingdom of God was first for Adam and Eve. But when they sinned, it all got twisted. 
And instead of their spiritual life being the first thing in their life, it, their minds took the place of their spiritual nature. Their thinking, their reasoning, their emotions, their human will that was twisted and tainted with self-centeredness and all of the desires of the human body took precedence over the spiritual nature. So everything got twisted and turned upside down when Adam and Eve sinned. And that's the way we've been living for 6,000 years on earth since, uh, since God created Adam and Eve. We've been living with our minds in control, our minds in, tra- char- in charge. And it's not that you turn your mind off when you're born again, but God wants to give us the mind of Christ. How many hear what I'm saying? In fact, God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My net ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. So when you come back to Jesus, how many know the spiritual life comes back alive? The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. And then listen to what God does. After you're born again, he wants you to take the next step, get baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's uncanny to me. Listen, that with the baptism with the Holy Spirit comes another way to pray. Let me say it this way. All that praying in the Spirit is, or praying in, as the Scripture says in several translations, other tongues is, all that is is my spirit, your spirit, talking to God without the mind being involved. It's direct spirit to spirit communion with God. Probably not unlike Adam and Eve had, not that they did this, it wasn't part of their dispensation, but they had a direct line to God and spiritually they were in tune with God and could hear his voice. And in a similar way, now God's restored that with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And when you pray in the spirit, you have a direct link to God. It's spirit to spirit, your spirit with God's who is a spirit. Can, isn't that awesome? And it's uncanny to me, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he said, the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. We use it to bless and we curse. If God can get a hold of your tongue, how many know he can get a hold of your life? Amen. Proverbs says death and life or in the power of the tongue. How many hear me? So if God can get a hold of your tongue, he can get a hold of you, and it's uncanny to me. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God says, give me use of your tongue. Give me your vocal organ. Give me the ability to speak. Let me anoint that with myself. Let me give you a gift that will once again align your spirit with me. And let me commune with you without that thing between your ears getting so involved that you can't hear me well. How many hear me? That's really, really awesome. So the apostle Paul said this. He said this in, uh, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, this is amplified. My spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. But my mind is unproductive, bears no fruit, and helps nobody. Now I've done this, like I said, for over 15,000 days of my life and many of those days I spend time I got up this morning I usually get up on Sunday morning at 4 30 by 5 o'clock I'm generally praying in the spirit and I do it for two hours say why well because uh, you'll find later it builds me up and it also helps me to be able to minister and it keeps a real open line between me and the father so I can hear his voice and the Holy Spirit can move through me in the way he wants to I start my every day that way I pray at least an hour now you don't have to start start with two minutes Start with three minutes. Start with five minutes. A little grove. I've been doing this for 42 years. And now I take plenty of time. And y'all, every day I take time. Why? Because, because when you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying the will of God. Listen to this. And this is my point number three as I come to a quick conclusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. This is amplified. This, this is what you do when you're praying in the Spirit. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God... For no one understands or catches his meaning. Now let's let's start, let's go back over that. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. So I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to anybody but God, right? So let me ask you a question. If praying in tongues or praying in the Spirit is talking to God, number one, is there any value in talking to God? Yes or no? So if praying in the Spirit is talking to God, is there value in praying in the Spirit? Yes or no? Yeah. 
Now, so he says, one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but God, no one understands or catches his meaning. That means other people don't know what you're saying, so you don't need to be doing it in church like the Corinthians were because people, you're not talking to others anyway, talking to God. I don't need to preach in this language. No, it's not for you, it's for him. So when I'm off by myself, I say, Father, I, I talk in English. He said, I'll pray with the Spirit. I'll pray with the understanding. I say, Father, I got this problem. I got that problem. Lord, I pray about these hurricane victims, you know, and praying about Victory Church folk and the needs they have and this person in the family and this and that and the other. And I'm praying. And they say, Lord, I, I just feel like there's other things I need to pray about, but I don't know what it is. So help me. And when I pray in the Spirit, I'm praying what he knows I need to pray. I'm praying according to the will of God. And he says... No one understands or catches his meaning when he prays in the Spirit because in the Holy Spirit, watch this, he utters secret truths and hidden things. Amplified. Secret truths. Everybody say secret truths. What are secret truths? They are things that you don't know and maybe nobody else knows. They could be about the past, present, or future. Right? Right? Then he says, hidden things, that's obvious. Hidden where? Well, not obvious to the understanding. They're hidden to you. How many know there are things coming up in your life that you don't know about? Amen. How many know there are things that God wants you to do that you don't know about? If you have children, you're a parent, how many know your your children are doing things that you don't know about it? Yes or no? There are things in your future that you don't know. You're not a prognosticator. You can't know the future that way, but God knows everything, past, present, and future. So God has given us a way to pray about things we don't know about in our, in our present <laughs> and future that are, that are spot on because you're speaking secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. We'll get, we'll get over this even further as we get into this, but it's pray, it's the, it's, you pray, Romans 8, 27 says, when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying according to the will of God. And how, what better way to pray is there than to pray according to the will of God? How many see that? So some people think there's not rhyme, no reason, or any reason to daily pray in the Spirit, but that's not what the Scriptures reveal. Scriptures reveal when you pray in the Spirit, you're talking to God, and you're talking about things you don't know you need to pray about. Huh? I've got a lot I want to say. We'll have to wait till next Sunday, but let me give you a couple of examples. This is how this works. In February of 1980, I had been married for five months to my beautiful wife, Susan, who's in children's ministry, first service. And I was in our apartment and I was in our bedroom and I was sitting on the bed and I was pray- I just got home from working 10 hours. She had just got home. She was in the kitchen cooking. And I was praying in the spirit and something floated up from inside me. And you know what it was? I heard the words inside. Not here, here. Just intuitively. Go to Rhema Bible Training Center. So what? Later on, I went to Susan and said, Susan, I've been praying in the Spirit. And I hear, go to Rama in Tulsa. She said, that's what I got. I said, we're going. And we went. Now, how did I know to do that? I'd been praying in the Spirit about secret truths. God knew my future. He knew I'd be in ministry. And that's how I figured it out. I was minding my own business, praying in the Spirit. In 1984, I had a severe car accident January 3rd, and to make a long story short, we had a terrible blizzard kind of a situation in Tulsa, Oklahoma that covered half the country. (coughs) Just terrible thing. It would get below zero at night. I mean, it was like two below sometimes or, or, you know, somewhere around there. And, uh, And everything would refreeze black ice. Well, I got out on the road with my little Mustang that I loved, put it in second gear, and I started slipping, and I... I did, I did, my car turned around and round and round all the way down a hill. January 3rd, 1984, it was 527 in the morning because I just looked at my watch. I can remember it just like that. I was going, and while I was going down that hill, there was a, there was a, a drop off of 20 feet with a man-made cement bottom and no guardrails. On the other side, there was a, a light pole right at the very bottom of the hill. I'm going around, and while I'm going around, I couldn't control my car. I saw the light pole and saw, whoa, looks like a big drop-off. 
And all I could say going down the hill was, in the name of Jesus, just hollered it out, in the name of Jesus, because, man, I'm, something's going to happen. Y'all, just before I went, got to the bottom of the hill and fell off, I went to the side where there was a drop-off, and I went backwards, and my back wheel we measured later was six inches from going down. My car was like this. Make a long story short, it stopped just before it went over. Just like, I, I kept my foot on the brake, put on the emergency brake, opened the door, it flung out. I went around the car, holding on to the car, hoping the car wouldn't fall while I was holding on to it. Got to the passenger side, and the door was locked, and my keys were in the car. Went back around the car, reached for my keys, and fell 20 feet. Hit the man made by, thought I broke my hip, broke my wrist, right wrist. And water was flowing, about three inches of water flowing over, you know, my head. And I slightly went out, momentarily come back. And they took me to the city of faith and got my, you know, wrist fixed up and all that. Bottom line, I called my mother. Now, here's the value of praying in the Spirit. She said, Mitch, I've been praying for you the last few days. And she said, funny thing was, I would pray in the Spirit. See, you're praying secret through fruits, hidden things, right? She said, I was praying and, and I would pray in the Spirit. And then the only thing I could pray in English was in the name, she said, I hollered it out, in the name of Jesus. And I said, well, Mama, that's what I hollered out all the way down the hill, in the name of Jesus. Now, you know, my car didn't go down. I, I could have died. You understand? Now, I made a human error, broke my wrist. It taught me a lesson about prayer. How many know you need to pray, but you also need others praying for you? Fast forward to 2008, I'm in Goma, Congo, and the Hutus and Tutsis have been fighting for generations. Everybody told us it was safe for us to go. Bottom line, fighting broke out while we were there. An entourage of army uh, folk were coming in a, in, a, in a line out of the city where we were. I've got to make a long story short because of time. You've heard some of this before. Some of you have. Uh, the, the army convoys coming down, their tanks and troop carriers and, and big old guns and all kinds of armament, and they're just flying, I mean, helter, skelter. The soldiers are running on foot. Some of them are in troop carriers, and it's just a mess, and we can't figure, our, our SUV was on the side. We told the, hollered at the driver, pull over and stop. We don't know what's going on. And while we were on the side of the road, a tank, I promise, a tank, come out of formation and somehow got out of control and come right down the side of the road where we were and it got so close that I saw the shadow of the tank on the front of the car. And the tank, you know, the front of it's made, you know, uh, like that. And, and I, but I saw, and it was coming. And the only thing my mind would think was, what's it gonna feel like when I get crushed by metal? That's what my mind thought. There's a businessman beside me who was with, uh, and another minister that was in the front seat. And I mean, I try, I, I, immediately, two things happened. My door was locked, couldn't get out. And then I saw that thing coming. And y'all, before you can say scat, that, that tank, I guess they can pivot on a dime. It just went, pew, pew. and instead of hitting us, it was gone. I thought, where'd it go? When I got home, I, that's the reason we have people pray 24 hours a day when we're on missions trips. We had two people praying, one at 9 o'clock, one at 9.30, 30 minutes apiece. Both of them said when we got and we compared times, it was 3.30 in the afternoon there. It was 9, 9.30 here. Both of the people praying said we were praying in the spirit. We were crying out to God, and we knew something was wrong, and we didn't stop praying until we felt a release. They were speaking secret truths and hidden things and praying for me. And, you know, I would have been a pancake in a casket. Back in 2008, had they not been praying? How many hear me? So here's their value in praying in the Spirit. In, in my estimation, there's huge value. How many, I'll tell you one more instance. It's both natural and spiritual. This is how it works. I minded my own business. The second Monday of December, 1993, I'm pastoring a church in South Carolina. I'm shaving my face in the bathroom after taking a shower and, you know, you know, just shaving my face and, you know, looking at myself. I had hair at the time, looking at my hair and trying to get it in shape, shaving it. And I heard the words. I had just finished praying in the Spirit for about an hour or so. And I had finished, I took a shower and I was in there shaving. And while I'm shaving, I just finished praying in the Spirit. I heard, right here, go check your oil. I, just, I said, I've never checked my oil Monday Never Monday morning, seven, never at 7 o'clock on Monday. And I kept shaving, check your oil. I said, Stupid. I never check my oil on Monday morning. What? 
And I kept shaving. I've been praying in the spirit. Check your oil. I heard the word, check your oil. See, secret truths and hidden things. I said, that's stupid. So I put my clothes on, you know, and got down and, and had to get the kids, you know, and, and I had a van. So I popped the hood. Y'all, when I took the dipstick out where the oil was, they were sludge. Water and oil don't mix well in an engine. I pulled it out. Whoa. And I said, God, you must know something that I didn't know. The heads had burst on my engine and mixed oil and water. I took it immediately to a, a, to a, a guy to repair, repair guy. And you know what he said? This just happened. Had you driven this any length of time, you would have ruined it and had to buy a new engine or a new automobile. I said, thank As it was, it cost me $440 to get it fixed. Now, is God good? Now, I've got a lot to share, but I've got to stop. But I'm just telling you, I've lived enough of life in this way that I know it's best to do this because I don't know what's coming up and you don't know what's coming up and you don't know what's happening with your children, your spouse, your family, your finances, your job, your health, your future, your nation. But you know what? God knows. And if you'll just spend some time praying in the Spirit, I'm going to tell you how it works. If you do that, you're activating your human spirit. And when you pray in this way regularly, sometimes I get dry mouth praying and feel absolutely nothing. And I hear the words, you're wasting your time. And I know it's not God, it's the devil. How can I waste my time talking to God? No, my mind's not involved. It doesn't know and my mind's aggravated because I don't let my mind stay in charge. I let my spirit rise up. And it gets aggravated like, I don't know what you're talking about. Shut up. You ain't doing anything. I say, shut up. Just shut up. Mind you, half the, most of the time, not right anyhow. Shut up. I reason things out, but you've got to let your spirit take ascendancy. How many hear me? And you know I do it every day. And you know what? I have all these kinds of... I, I have experiences so frequently that I don't have time to tell you about all of them. I have them about every week. Something happens, and I know, well, I've been praying in the spirit, so... There it is. That's the reason that worked out that way. And that's the, I could just tell you instance after instance, ministry things, ministering to people, personal things, natural things, just everything that includes life, praying in the Spirit. Now, I want to encourage you. If you don't do if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you need to take some time. Maybe, I don't care if you start with two minutes, one minute. I started with two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Then I work my way up over a long period of time. 10 minutes, 15. You know, start where you're at, but do it because it'll make a profound difference in your life. And it could save your life as it has mine several times. And you might be praying for somebody that you don't know on the other side of the world that's a missionary. I got stories, y'all, that curl your hair if you had it about missionaries in, in dire straits and somebody prayed for them and they looked at the time it was the same time they were having a challenge on the other side of the world and nobody knew but the Holy Spirit knew and he helped them pray helped someone else pray for that mission isn't that awesome? stand up on your feet you get something out of that?